It is so good to be with you on Good Friday. So we're still going through our series called But Why, where we're answering the question of why the cross had to happen. And perhaps more particularly, what we're answering is why did the crucifixion event have to happen in the way that it happened? And especially on Good Friday, we, we often do feel the weight of the pain that Jesus experienced, especially on Good Friday. And I think at least by now, we have some understanding of why there had to be so much pain. I mean, in our, in our second week, we saw how a, a lot of the brutality of the cross was because Jesus was absorbing the righteous anger of God on our behalf. Last week, we saw how the blood that was shed leading to death was the necessary debt that needed to be paid in order for our sins to be forgiven. And in the first week, we saw just why Jesus would go through all of that together, and that was to demonstrate the love that God has for us. But this Good Friday, I want to look at the crucifixion event from a different camera angle. Up till now, we've really just focused on the pain that Jesus experienced. But there is another perspective of the crucifixion that often gets overlooked. And yet, in Scripture, at least in the Gospel accounts, it is a perspective that gets a lot of airtime. In fact, most of the airtime is on this one particular perspective that I want to share with you today. See, the cross of Jesus represents the fact that not only did Jesus bear our pain, but he also bore our shame. And we're going to see just how prevalent the topic of shame is and see just how Jesus bore our shame along with the pain that we deserved and how he dealt with that definitively on the cross. And to do that, we're going to turn to Mark's gospel and then we're going to have a look at it from some of the other Old Testament passages. So turn with me to Mark chapter 15, and I want to read to you that narrative of the crucifixion from verse 16 through to 39. Mark chapter 15, verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. 
He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. You know what amazes me about Mark's account of of this crucifixion event, and in fact, all of the gospel accounts, what really stands out to me is just how little detail is placed on the physical pain that Jesus endured. How little detail is given on the immense pain that he endured on the cross. For example simply says, verse 24, and they crucified him. That's it. Four words. We know what, what, that, what that means. We, we have visuals of that. Maybe from movies like The Passion of the Christ, of Jesus being strapped to the cross and then them taking those nails and the heavy hammer and striking them through each hand and through his feet and then lifting up the cross and dropping it into the earth. We know all the pain surrounding that, but, but all the scriptures just say is, and they crucified him. Similarly, when it comes to the whipping scene, we know how brutal that was. It just simply says in verse 15, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him. That's it. Having scourged Jesus. And we know, we know from the Old Testament this practice of scourging, and we know from Paul in 2 Corinthians that that scourging is the 40 lashes minus one that included this whip with bones and metal in it. And we know how that tore chunks of flesh out of Jesus. We know from Isaiah that he was so thoroughly beaten that he did not resemble a human being after this had happened to him. And we know all of that from tradition, from Old Testament, from other passages, but there's nothing explicit in the gospel accounts of the specific, detailed, physical pain that Jesus underwent. So why, if this crucifixion event is so central to our faith, and it is, and why, if it was so brutal, which it was, why don't the gospel writers give us detail on the physical pain that Jesus endured? Is it because they just expect us to know what crucified and scourged means? Maybe. Or maybe it was because... They did not want our response to what is clearly physical brutality. They did not want our response to be pity. So maybe when you read the devastating account of the physical brutality that Jesus underwent, we may be tempted to go, oh, shame. Poor Jesus. That would not be an appropriate response to what we sense on Good Friday. It is not appropriate to pity Jesus. No, no, no. I mean, he knew 
what was going to happen. He willingly stepped forward toward the cross. He could have called legions of angels, but knowing what he was about to go through, Jesus stepped forward. We don't pity Jesus on Good Friday. We worship him with gratitude. So maybe that's why the gospel writers don't indulge us with detail of the physical brutality. But they do indulge us with a lot of detail when it comes not to the pain that Jesus experienced, but to the shame that he experienced, especially in Mark's gospel. It's like Mark wants us to see this, to really see. He's telling us something. The shame that Jesus endured. So let's just replay that a little bit, Mark's account. And let's just specifically highlight the shame that Jesus endured. So verse 16 to 26, that's the scene of the soldiers who are gathered. We are told a whole battalion, 600 of them gather. And it seems the only reason they are gathering is to have some fun with Jesus. So they put on that mock purple robe. They give him that crown of thorns. They place that scepter in his hands, which is just sarcastic mockery. And they kneel in homage to him. And they spit at him. Have you ever spat in someone's face? What have you got to be feeling To spit in someone's face. Have you ever had someone spit in your face? And experienced that shame. And as they crucify him. Detail is given of how they strip him of his clothes. Expose him. Perhaps naked. Maybe just with a loin cloth. But there he is. Exposed. Shamed. And then they gamble for his clothes at his feet. And of course, the sign above him, the king of the Jews, just echoing what the soldiers had said to Jesus. Hail, king of the Jews, which is just really this parody of Caesar's salute, which is Ave, Caesar, Victor, Imperator. Now they're mocking Jesus. Hail, uh, Jesus, king of the Jews. To see the specific attention given to mockery, Verse 27 and 28, this is the account of the two thieves on either side of Jesus. We read in verse 32, those who were crucified with him also mocked him. Now hang on, these guys are also strung up on a cross in their own shame. And they're adding shame to Jesus. I mean, Luke tells us just what the content of that was. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and also us. Verse 29 to 32, the passers-by, spectators and the chief priests and the scribes. I guess you could summarize what they were shouting at Jesus, which went something like, like this. We're ready to worship you, Jesus. Just come down. Oh, wait. You can't. By the way, the word used there when it says that they derided him is really the word blasphemed, but it's a little heavier than just like taking God's name in vain. It's kind of this heavy, angry, blasphemous insult. I mean, you make no mistake. These guys were hurling abuse and insult to Jesus. I mean, I don't want to be controversial here without reason but I mean they were throwing like f bombs expletives in anger at Jesus that's what was really happening here and then maybe to cap it off verse 33 to 36 perhaps the ultimate sign of mockery something a detail that all of the gospels include they gave somebody came took a sponge filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to Jesus. You might be tempted to think, oh, well, that's nice. Someone's offering him something to drink. Not so fast. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, They gave me poison for food, 
and for my thirst they gave me sour wine. That's like somebody who's desperate and dying of thirst and you offer them paraffin. What do you have to be feeling to do that? It's an ultimate insult, mockery and shame. And you see this detail in other classic Easter passages, like in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, a classic Good Friday passage. Verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Just have a look at those words there, despised. Think about the word despised for a second. What do you despise? So, I mean, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking, right, the house, you know, housework, chores, maintenance. I mean, would you say you despise doing the dishes? I mean, no, I mean, you, you might not like that, but like despised is too strong a word <laughs> to describe how you feel about household chores. Or how about despising someone? Like, is there a person that you despise? Like, for example, someone you're angry with? Would you say that you despise them? I don't, I don't think so. I think that's going too far for someone that you're angry with. What about someone that's hurt you? Do you despise them? Maybe, maybe in some instances. What about hate? Somebody you hate, would you say that you despise them? Now we're getting closer to what despised means. It means hatred with intensity. He was despised and rejected. How does that word land with you? Rejected. Cast aside. Nobody wants him. One of the heaviest words for us to bear. So unwanted was Jesus on the cross that he was rejected. And as one from whom men hide their faces. Think about this, like you're walking, walking through the shops and you see someone that you know coming down the other way. And it's maybe someone you're not maybe in good relationship with at this point. And they see you and, and you know you've seen them and they pretend to not see you and kind of on their phones walk past you. But how embarrassing is that? Imagine you with somebody and you've like waved to them and the other person's looking going, well, you know, you're trying to explain that. Oh, maybe they didn't see me. It's awkward. It's embarrassing. The thing about like you watching a show, I often have this, I'm watching a TV show. And I mean, this is one of those maybe comedies and it's just like the person's just embarrassing themselves. And I, I, I can't watch. I like, turn my face because I'm embarrassed for them because of their shame. Listen, that's nothing like what's going on here. So contemptible was the sight of Jesus that just in this moment that people could not look at him. I was so embarrassed at the sight of him. That's how contemptible he was. And then it says, we esteemed him not. In other words, we considered that he had zero value. We esteemed him not. He is worth nothing. Now, of course, in Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 4, there is the element of physical suffering there too. A man of sorrows, which is describing a man in pain. And acquainted with grief means really carrying sickness, which is interesting. In our current COVID-19 climate, what I was saying in the second sermon, that he was bearing the effects of sickness, physical pain. But even after describing physical pain, before that as he was despised, and after describing pain, it again repeats, he was despised. It's like this sandwich in the middle is pain, but on both sides is he was despised. 
prophet Isaiah wants us to see that. The shame that Jesus endured. Psalm 22 is one of those very definite messianic psalms. It's just a very clear prophecy about the crucifixion of Jesus, much like Psalm 69 that I read from earlier. Just very crystal clear. It starts out verse 1 of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, those were Jesus' words. He was fulfilling that prophecy. Verse 18, it says, And they divide my garments among them, for my clothing they cast lots. I mean, this was written many years before the crucifixion. It was a pro- pro- prophecy of what would happen on the cross. Very definite prophecy, Psalm 22. But now listen to this description of the shame. Verse 6 to 7. But I am a worm and not even a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. In this prophetic psalm, Such debilitating description of shame. I am a worm. So worthless. I'm not even a man. I'm not even some other animal with some kind of... A a worm. This is the depth of shame that Jesus Christ endured on Good Friday. On the cross. The reality is that the cross was not just an instrument of pain. It was certainly an instrument of pain. But it was designed not just to be an instrument of pain, but an instrument of shame. And Jesus experienced that shame in an order of magnitude exponentially higher than which it was designed for. So the question is, but why? Why did he have to endure this immense amount of shame? Well, Hebrews chapter 12 is going to give us the answer. Verse 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that fascinating? We've just gone through how Jesus endured shame and he was despised on the cross. But now he despises the shame. The word despises, Jesus despises the shame here, means he made the shame negligible and worthless. In other words, when it says he despised the shame, he cast it off. He threw it away. He buried it. It was absorbed. It was dissolved. It disappeared. And we know that that was definitive because it says, and he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That is a place of prominence, of authority, of power. There's no way anyone carrying shame would be seated there. But he had dealt with the shame, despised it, cast it off, and now he's seated. It's evidence at the right hand of the throne of God, which means the shame that was on him has been dealt with. Okay. Now let's really focus here. Let's remember the obvious truth. The shame that Jesus carried through the crucifixion event 
was not his shame. That was our shame. Just like he took our sin upon him, he took the shame associated with that sin upon him. He was carrying our shame. He endured our shame. And so when it says that he cast off the shame, it means he cast off, he absorbed, he dealt with our shame. It's our shame that has been buried. It is our shame that has been dissolved. That was for us. That's why Isaiah the prophet would say, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace by his wounds we are healed not only does the cross of Jesus remove our pain or remove the pain that was associated with our sin the cross of jesus also definitively removes our shame just as it definitively removed god's wrath and judgment and the debt and penalty of sin so it listen definitively removed the shame associated with our sin. Isn't that exceptionally good news indeed? If you think about it, there's not much in life that we hate more than shame. I think most of us, if we had a choice, would choose pain over shame. Wouldn't you? I think I would. If I'd done something so humiliating, something so devastating, just so much shame, I, I would want to say, hey man, just punish me. Just punish me. Just, you know, beat me now so that at least it's over with. Most people would choose pain over shame because of the debilitating effects of shame. Have you ever felt despised? Have you been hated? And I'm not, I'm not just talking like people who don't like you. I mean by people close to you. Have you felt hatred towards you? Have you been Rejected? Do you feel unwanted? Discarded? Have you ever felt like people hide their faces from you? Just avoid you. It's just too embarrassing to associate with you. Have you ever felt like people devalue you? Esteem you not? Like you're just not worth anything? To anyone, that ever happened to you? In other words, I'm asking, have you ever felt shame? Of course you have. We've all felt shame. We all carry immense amounts of shame. Hey, listen. Jesus bore our shame. He carried it, literally. All the shame you can think of in your life, past, or your present shame, or your future shame, he's, he's already carried that. And he absorbed it. And he deposited it in the grave. And then he rose, but he left your shame, my shame. He left it there. It's dissolved. You experience shame? You needn't. Jesus bore our shame. If 
you think about it, there's three sources of shame that we experience in our lives. One is shame that comes from our own mistakes. Our mess-ups. It's on us. Greed, lust, gluttony, infidelity, anger, violence, sowing dissension, gossip, which is adding shame to someone else. We experience shame through our own mistakes, our addictions, our hang-ups. Jesus bore that shame. But we also experience shame, sometimes not from our own mistakes. We experience shame from other people's mistakes, from their sinfulness. They do things to hurt us, but instead of them carrying shame attached to their sinfulness, we're the ones left carrying the shame. And I'm speaking about kind of things like victims of abuse. Hey, listen. The shame that Jesus bore was also not his own shame. He was also bearing the shame that came from somebody else. So your shame, that's not rightfully yours, but you feel it. Jesus knows. He knows what that feels like. And he's carried it. And he's released it. He wants to release you from that shame. Sometimes we experience shame just through being living as people in a fallen world. Shame due to circumstances outside of our control. This might be like you might be carrying shame because of the way you were born. Like, I mean, the way you look, you wish you were more beautiful, more handsome, more talented, stronger. And you feel ashamed because you're not. And that's outside of your control. Or maybe you've fallen victim to the crumbling circumstances around us. Maybe you've lost your job along with many others due to coronavirus. Or maybe you made huge investments that have failed. It's not your fault, but you're carrying shame. It's no, it's no one else's fault either. It's just the circumstances of living, or the result of living in a fallen world. Hey, remember, nothing that was created was created in shame. In other words, you were not created in shame. That shame is a result of a fallen world, which is a result of sin. And Jesus carried that shame too. Hey, listen. We all have shame. Jesus knows our shame. Not only does he know it, does he know what it's like, he carried it, our shame. He endured the full extent of our shame in a way that we never could. And he dealt with it. It is finished. I would love for you to experience that release today. And so I'm going to pray and I'm going to have a little bit more time after the sermon today, a couple more songs to reflect on this. I want to really just want to pray a simple prayer that as we reflect today on the crucifixion of Jesus, if we remember that not only did he bear our pain, but also our shame, Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus, as we sit this Good Friday, under the weight, the immensity of this crucifixion event. We can't know what that's like and we're so thankful we don't have to. Jesus, I pray that every person would experience the release of knowing their sins are forgiven, paid for. That the righteous anger that should be directed towards us has been diverted and absorbed. 
that we would also know, especially today. That we have been released from shame. Holy Spirit, would you apply this to us? Free us. So we can live as the free followers of Jesus that we're designed to be, that we're meant to be, that you paid for, Lord Jesus. Make it happen in our hearts today, I pray. Amen. We're going to worship a little bit more. Depending on when you started this service, there's going to be a little bit of time to prepare for communion. And I can say now, much earlier in the week, I'm just really looking forward to sharing at the communion table with you live at half past 11. I will see you there.